hello. Hi, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. All right, I see a few people on the chat responding, which means you can hear me. Fantastic. All right, so I will get started. Okay. So hi everyone, my name is Yo-Yo Eto and I work with the Blueprint Career Services team here at the School of Continuing Studies. Um, I have the pleasure and the privilege to host this Blueprint Real Talk conversation today, where we'll be chatting with our panelists about navigating their nonlinear um, career crossroad career paths. Um, for those of you who don't know, or this is your first time attending one of our events, Blueprint Career Services is a newer offering here at the school, uh, created to work alongside you as you design a clear path to the future you envision for your career journey, wherever it might take you. So this um, Blueprint Career Services provides diverse programming ranging from panel sessions such as this one today, to cohort-based series, to strengths-based focus coaching sessions, an online portal with articles and templates to, take, to tackle the practical aspects of your career development. So all of you found this event. So I'm assuming you already have a, um, an account on the Blueprint Portal, but if you don't, you're welcome to sign up for the Blueprint Portal, which you'll find on the School's Continuing Studies website. Um, we continue to add events and resources there, so please continue to check um, often. So before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is, today this meeting place is still home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. I'd also like to acknowledge that in this remote world, you might be joining us today from many places near and far, and I want to acknowledge the traditional owners and caretakers of those lands from where you're coming. So it is now my pleasure to welcome our panelists for today. I'm here today with Anna Believa. Erica Capito, and BJ Terzik. So to give you an introduction to them, I'll read a quick intro of their bios. There's going to be a lot more that's going to be shared, um, but I will do quick intros and then I'll ask them to turn their cameras on so we can see their faces. So Anna is an entre entrepreneur, founder, and CEO of The Career Diet. Her journey started as an international student who didn't speak English fluently, applied to hundreds of roles, and got endless rejections. After learning how employers hire, Anna went on to being headhunted for six-figure job offers without applying and negotiating a salary that's 40% above industry standards. I want to hear all about that. Um, and in the last 10 years, Anna was able to successfully switch industry twice, from accounting to consumer goods to recruitment, without a pay cut or starting from the bottom. Her personal experience navigating the job market and years in the recruitment industry drove her to start the career diet where she helps ambitious go-getters achieve clarity on what their dream job is and how to land it. Looking forward to chatting more, Anna. Erica has spent 25 years as an educator, facilitator, producer, and organizer, liaising with various organizations in politics, labor, culture, and the arts to bring creative strategies to their outreach and communication initiatives. Trained as a dramaturg and a director, she has built a myriad of interdisciplinary, I always have a hard time saying that word, um, festivals and has curated and hosted events with the purpose of engaging audiences with specific calls to action. She's passionate about designing opportunities to advance progressive social change. Before her current position as Director of Strategy for an Indigenous Youth Organization, CRE, she was the events curator at the, at the Broadbent Institute and a literary manager at Toronto's Nightwood Theatre. And then last but not least, Vijay Terzik. Inspiring humanity in business. That's Vijay's goal as the founder of Most Connected, a boutique consultancy that takes a value-based, customer-driven approach to guide business strategy. Being born, in, being born in Yugoslavia, a country once prosperous, yet now divided, has shaped Vijay's worldview and instilled in him the desire to create connections. This fueled his career growth from engineer to project manager and now to a business consultant. All right, so we'll take the we'll take the slide deck down and ask the panelists to turn their cameras on. Um, just for you all to know, I have prepared from some questions ahead of time for our panelists today. Um, 
to begin the conversation. But you'll see on your screen the option to submit questions using the Q&A function. So I've seen some of you have found the chat function. You can also find the Q&A function. And you're welcome to submit questions during the moderated part of this session. Um, throughout the session, you're welcome to, to submit your questions. And then I will allow ample time at the end um, for you to ask more questions and for me to ask those questions. So. To begin, um, we heard your bios and all of that, and there's sometimes this misconception that career success means having an A to Z plan and then doing it in that order. Um, so we heard your bios and what you currently do. My first question is, was this what you always wanted to do? Um, and kind of as a, as a follow-up, what forced or helped you um, determine what direction you wanted to go? And I'll ask Anna to go first. <laughs> um, all right. Well, you did share a little bit in my bio that I went from accounting to consumer goods to recruitment to now uh, running my own business. Uh, so I think it's safe to say just from that journey that I did not have a plan when I started. And uh, just like a lot of people, when I was younger, when I was still in school, I had no idea, just zero idea what I wanted to do. All I knew was that I wanted to work for a cool company. <laughs> that's, that's, and that really came from looking back. It came from my family that you need to work for this big global organization that's going to help you grow in your career. And that's what I was going after. And then when I went to grad school, uh, something that I was hearing was that, oh, what's cool <laughs> and hard to get into is management consulting. So that's, again, something that came from the outside. I just heard it and said, you know what? Sure, I'll just pursue that. And it didn't happen for me. I worked really hard, but I never got into management consulting. And I felt like a failure for years. And I did what most people do, which is I just took a job that I could. I kind of just fell into accounting and that world because I needed to pay my bills just like everyone else. And all while feeling like I failed and like I'm completely inadequate. Um, but that job helped me to start meeting with the hiring managers and learning how they actually hire, um, what that process really looks like. And I was really learning from the inside out. And that's when I realized, okay, my approach that I took initially didn't work. Uh, I need a different approach. And that's where I also started thinking, okay, well, this subject matter, accounting, is not something that makes me that ex feeling that excited. So I started really digging deep into now me, not what everyone else was saying, what was cool, uh, what was out there, what my family was saying, or what the school was saying was cool. What did I enjoy doing on a daily basis? What kind of tasks on my job did I actually enjoy doing? What is the subject matter that I was excited about. And there were a few things that were coming up for me, fitness and interior design, like completely different from what I did before. Um, and I, after I did all of this, inner, I call it looking inward and really asking myself those questions is when I started realizing, okay, I do want to switch and I want to switch completely. And this is how, you know, consumer goods came up, which was really related to um, to interior design, which is kind of the direction that I decided to take it. Um, so I went from working in accounting to, you know, creating, uh, exclusive collections for accounts like Nordstrom and anthropology. So completely just 180 degree shift. And I thought back then that this was my dream job. If you knew me back then, I just wouldn't shut up about it because I thought this was the coolest job in the world. Um, but after a few years in the industry, I changed. And again, looking inward, I'm like, something doesn't feel right. Like I thought this is it. Like I'm working with designers. This is so cool. But after a while, again, I'm like, hmm, something, it doesn't feel right. Again, I didn't have a plan of what's next, but I just looked inward again. And I knew that I changed. My values changed. And I didn't really care about stuff anymore, like physical products, I wanted to work with people and make a difference kind of that in that, like that way. Mm -hmm. um, so this is how recruitment came up. I'm like, okay, I'm actually going to be making this real change in someone's life. Um, so no, I didn't have a plan. <laughs> um, and then after working at recruitment, I kind of saw this 
uh, this disconnect between what employers are looking for and how candidates are job searching, which is how my business came about, uh, which again, 10 years ago, I had no idea that this is what I would be doing. Um, but the biggest lesson I think for me here is, and that's what I teach my students now is looking inward and checking in with yourself over and over and over again, because you will change what is important to you, what you value will change. But the answer at the end of the day is always starts with looking inward. So that's, that's kind of my, my little spill here on, (laughs) on not having an A to Z plan when I started. Yeah. It's interesting to hear the, um, the point at which you also which you also started feeling more confident and changing and moving around was when you started listening to yourself and what it was you wanted and enjoyed and um, the ability to articulate and identify that is also very important so really interesting to hear that we'll dive into more questions as well but I'll pass it off to VJ now actually tell us tell us yours yeah I love what Anna has shared thank you Yo-Yo I love what Anna has shared and a similar I would say I had no plan uh so I think two things that I have the plan I probably had a dream or, or a feeling, but uh, I didn't follow through with it. So when I first came to Canada, as, I, as, a, as Yo-Yo mentioned in the bio, I didn't know any English. I felt really sort of lost and I, 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 didn't, I, and I was having a hard time fitting in, but uh, it was in those early years that teachers really um, resonated with me. I remember Mr. Romero was the teacher. Uh, and I think it was grade three that sort of inspired me and made me feel welcome. And I'm like, you know what, when I grow up, I want to be a teacher. I want to be able to give that to students in the same way that these teachers did. So of course I became an engineer. (laughs) You know, sometimes you have that passion and you start to grow you, as you go through school, you might lose sight of it a little bit. And then you hear the pressures of, well, teachers don't make as much. So there's a lot of work in that. Uh, Are you sure you want to do that? And so caving in, I guess, to some of those norms, I went into the path of an engineer and I did that for about 10 years. And so I'm trying to say there wasn't a plan. And so I think one of your other questions, Yo-Yo, was what changed that? Mm -hmm. And so here I was, an engineer. I was in the nuclear industry, oil and gas. And similar to Anna, I wasn't finding a sense of fulfillment in that type of work. I wanted to connect more with people. And it was difficult. Uh, It was difficult making good money in an industry, and it was hard to to get out of it. And so what saved me was I got laid off. (laughs) Uh, There was a recession, oil and gas. I think it was in 2016. In February, March, I got laid off. In that September, I went back to school to do my master's uh, in business. And that was a full career sort of pivot for me. At that moment, I was walking down a hallway. There was a bulletin to volunteer in Kenya to be an entrepreneurial, social entrepreneur teacher. I'm like, you know what? I'm doing that. Probably 20 years after that initial dream to be a teacher. I saw the bulletin and that changed the course of my career. And that's what brings me to my work that I do today. Mm-hmm. Thanks for sharing, BJ. It's interesting you talk about um, a layoff kind of forcing you into changing. I've heard, I, I used to have a professor who said the same thing, a layoff was the best thing that ever happened to her. And I was like, are you crazy? But um, it's actually sometimes the external force of having to redirect is, is allows you to relook at what it is that you you um, want to do and where you want to go. So I'd be interested to hear more about, you know, um, the fear that can sometimes come from, from having a layoff. But we'll get into that a little bit more. Let's have Erica give us a little bit of an intro about your A to Z plan as well. Yeah, great. And it's been so great hearing um, from Vijay and Anna's history as well. I also just really did not have a plan. Um, there was no A to Z plan for me at all. Um, I think I was always really kind of active as a student, but totally directionalist. I changed my major a hundred times in undergrad. And um, I knew I was passionate about things, but I had no idea how that would like land as a job or a career. Um, And in fact, you know, I always say I have the type of jobs that like are really hard to kind of share at a party. Like, what do you do? And I can't just say the thing I do always, you know. So even when I became a dramaturg, um, that was sort of through a, connection through a grad school class I didn't entirely know what a dramaturg was and in fact even professionally for those of you online who might even know what a dramaturg is um, you know the entire 
discourse around dramaturgy is kind of defining what it is. So it, it really was just about being um, responsive to opportunities at the moment. And so through this graduate school in theater, I, which again was a bit of a focus academically that kind of just, I fell into, I was passionate about a lot of things. Um, I liked being a student and I had the great privilege to be able to do it for grad school and then kind of found my first uh, career arc that way. Um, and now I'm a director of strategy at a not-for-profit that focuses on, you know, Indigenous youth-led initiatives. Um, I'm not Indigenous. I'm not a youth by any standards. Um, and I had no idea how I would have gotten there. Um, but after doing, you know, after being in the in theater and Canadian theater for about 15 years um, as a dramaturg and literary manager, which essentially just means script development. We can talk about that if it interests people or not. Um, and I had a real career in the arts and people really want that, right? And I felt really privileged to have that. Um, you know, people would volunteer at that time to sort of do the work that we were doing professionally. And I felt really grateful for it. But going back to that party analogy, people would ask what I did and I did not want to talk about it. Like everything else in my life felt more exciting than what I did on a day-to-day -day basis at work. There were moments, but it wasn't driving me. Um, and I was feeling really stuck in this theater career 15 years in. I felt like I'd reached sort of the professional pinnacle and I didn't feel very motivated to go on. Mm -hmm. But always, even in my work in theater and certainly in my like, you know, after hours time, I was really engaged in, for lack of a better umbrella term, social justice initiatives. And so I was organizing, I was volunteering, I was doing things then. And it just struck me that like, I can kind of shift these two things. I could still be a great advocate of the arts and, and engage that way. But like, as a job, I would feel better going to every single day would be to try to think about how I was affecting the world around me. And to go back to what Anna was saying, I think even though I have a hard time looking inward and I love that and I'm gonna take that home with me today, um, I think I was maybe forced through circumstance because I just couldn't deal with external anymore. I, like I would go to this job that was fine and even you know, desired, but it didn't feel right for me. Mm -hmm. And um, I made a real conscious effort to try to find an organization, not-for-profit that had at the base of it, some sort of purpose-driven vision. Mm -hmm. um, so I first took the stepping stone uh, to the Broadband Institute, and um, we can talk about the details of how that happened later if, if it interests anyone. And out of that, um, made my way to my second organization now that I've worked for, which is CRE. Nice. Thanks for sharing that. And I think one of the things that um, stood out again, and from everybody I'm hearing, is there's like a, a feeling of this doesn't feel right. I'm not too sure why. And then having to look inward or at least having to navigate some kind of external pressure. And and with, with I guess, leads me a little bit to my next question, because in hearing your stories, um, many I fear change. Many, many people fear change, in particular, um, the fear of failure that can come from change, the fear that I might not actually be able to do what it is I think. So what fears did you have um, with your career pivots or changes and how did you navigate those? Um, and I will I will ask Erica to just take us from here. <laughs> I'll just let you keep going. Yeah, I think, and I'm learning this way more from the youth that I work with. And to clarify, youth is 30 and under, and 18 to 30 is mostly the youth that my organization works with. But like, embrace the fear, sit in the muck, like, right? Isn't we're supposed to feel our feelings? Um, you know, this is not something I knew to do before. This is something I'm really embracing now. And so, um, I I was scared. Of course, your your job is your identity. It is your literal means of survival. Um, it is so, it's such a determinant to how you live your both, you know, micro life and your macro life. Mm -hmm. um, and at the same time, it is also just a part of who you are, right? And, and at the time that I made this big career choice, I'd already had two kids. And that certainly took up a lot of emphasis and focus in my life. And, um, you know, I was able to sort of just understand the fear, again, grateful and privileged enough to have support around me, family and, you know, community that could help hold me up and um, just kind of go for it. The harder part about the fear was not like making a change from something known to something known. It was this 
big interstitial period of the unknown, that like moment where you're just like, I'm just gonna, again, I think both active and passionate, but directionalist. And it's great um, for the people who are on this call right now, because obviously like Anna's got, um, you know, like a system set up that could help people with some of these things and this whole, you know, this Blueprint Career Services, this is part of that. And like these services will, you know, add value to those sorts of um, directions. I wish I knew enough to like seek out these services at the time, because I think really it was just a lot of floundering mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, tr trying to figure it out as I went. So I don't have any wise words of wisdom, except like, you will be scared. It is scary. Mm -hmm. That is true for anybody's life. And um, that's okay. That's okay. Like embrace it. Right. So essentially do it afraid. Yeah, I, I don't know how we, if, if I had the magic formula for removing the uncomfortable emotions, you know, then I would, I would save a bit on, on you know, therapy bills. So <laughs> I just have to embrace that. I think you just have to embrace it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um, Anna, I'll, pa I'll pass it on to you. Um, well, I, I, as um, Erica, you were, you were telling your story, I was thinking how, um, I actually felt very alone because I physically was as a former international student, I didn't really have any family here, any support. So in my mind, if I cannot, like I cannot do it, there's no other option. It has to work out if I'm changing industries. And when I change industries, I actually also moved across the country from Vancouver to Toronto. So I left my job and it just, it had to work out. And the fears that were coming up were, well, what if it doesn't? What if I'm not successful? What if I cannot make money? Like, what am I physically going to do? I don't have a parent's house that I can move back into. That's not an option. Mm. Um, so something that I learned that really has helped me and I know um, has really helped now my students as well is this fact that those thoughts that what if this doesn't work out? What if I'm not successful? What if I don't have enough education, background, what have you? All of those mm. thoughts and fears are normal. Mm. In fact, you're supposed to have them. What? Like when I learned that you're supposed to have them, my mind was blown. Mm. You're supposed to have them because that's your brain protecting you. Because staying in the known, what Erica was saying, staying in the known is safety for your brain because it's familiar, you know what's happening. So your brain wants you to be safe, right? That's your survival instinct. Right. But going to the unknown, that's danger for your brain. That's really means danger. So your brain will do more for you to protect you from failure. So to protect you from danger, from the unknown, than to help you to get to the uh, to the success. So your brain will do more to offer you those thoughts. What if, what if I'm not successful? I don't have enough X to do this. Who would hire me for insert the job, right? So your brain will continue to offer those thoughts because it's its job. So when I learned that, honestly, my mind was just blown. Okay. This is normal. I'm supposed to have these thoughts. Now, can I offer my brain other thoughts? Mm -hmm. So the, the tool that I learned was, okay, is it possible that I'm not going to be successful, that I'm not going to land this job in this industry? Yeah. Like that's a real scenario. That's a valid thought that my brain is offering me. And, mm -hmm. and then you add in your brain, you add and, and then what? And I can try again and I can try a different industry and I can go back to the job that I had right? And what? So you offer your brain those solutions. And especially when I'm going through a lot and there are a lot of those thoughts coming up, I quite literally use my phone and write those thoughts down mm -hmm. <laughs> so that I don't let my brain spiral down. Like, huh, thank you, brain. <laughs> thank you. This is, this, this is you protecting me. Thank you. I'm going to write this down. And, and what? Mm -hmm. I'm not brushing this off. I'm acknowledging this is correct. This can happen. And then what? Mm. So this is the tool that I use and it works really, really well. So I hope you guys try it. 
Thanks, Anna. Um, the the and what um, reminds me of, so I had my little stint in drama too. Um, well, the yes and that happens in improvisation um, when you're doing improv. And so, yeah, like just continuing to build on a thought. And so that's, I like the idea of writing it down as well. Um, sorry, BJ, you had unmuted yourself. I think you were ready to go. Oh, no, I was, I think I was off mute already. Okay, okay. Well, I'll let you go anyway. <laughs> okay, sure. I was just... Um... I think, you know, I was thinking about this question and I, I like what Anna and Erica have shared. And I, I had a hard time pinpoint like the exact fear. I think there were several fears. It was like, I'm an engineer. If I leave engineering, how am I gonna, I'm gonna lose all those skills. I think in, 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 um, in Anna's bio, you mentioned how when she transitioned career, she didn't have to start quote unquote at the bottom. So it's like, how do I leave into something new? I'm gonna go to the bottom. So those were some of the, some of the fears. But I'd say probably for me, the biggest challenge was I wasn't looking, and I think Anna and Erica talked about, I wasn't looking to ask myself. I was, I was almost too afraid to ask the question, what is my fear? But I was, I was unaware that there was even fear to be considered. You know, as an engineer, I always thought of myself as a very logical, analytical person. It didn't really give a lot of opportunity or room for me to be like, hey, how do I check in and see exactly what is the fear? Why am I afraid of it? Um, what's preventing me from taking a step? So I think more was a, the unawareness of the fear. And mm. I think like, um, like Anna said, you're supposed to have them. Well, I'm like, wait a second. If I'm fearful, there's something wrong with me. I'm an engineer. I'm, I'm progressing in my career. What do I have to be afraid of? And so I think for me, it was just even the challenge of addressing that to myself, talking to my friends that, hey, I'm having some of these challenges with my career. Uh, that it never allowed me an opportunity to to dig into it. And mm. so I think over time, recognizing that unfulfillment at work, I think it came slowly to be like, oh, okay, let me let me start exploring what that looks like. And over time, I was able to start asking that. And then when the layoff had happened, I already knew I wanted to sort of start looking at a different career, going back to more people connection through business. And mm. I'm like, okay, this is the perfect opportunity to do that. And one of the great things from the master's program was there was a lot of uh, opportunity to to sort of there was a creativity class, a class to really allow us to explore what what a future career might look like. Mm, nice. Um, it's actually um, what and, and my next question was was something that kind of came through from what, from what everyone was saying is that like with pivoting and transitioning careers, um, sometimes people assume that I'm just throwing everything away that I've done, no longer relevant. Um, but that doesn't always that's not always what it means. And even when things don't necessarily look like they connect to each other, they actually do. Um, so my question, I'll, I'll start with you, VJ. Um, how did your past experiences help you? prepare for where you are today and and how were you even able to identify articulate what those skills and strengths were that you brought yeah no like vastly like i i think i i, I love the career i'm in right now and sort of business consulting but would i have changed the 10 years and the undergraduate experience as an engineer no i i love i love that i did that I, and i gained so much i think i just it was a mind shift that had to take place mm -hmm. one of my friends engineer also who's also now a business consultant his expression that really resonated with me. And it was this engineering isn't just a career, it's a mindset. Mm -hmm. Engineering isn't just a career, it's a mindset. So for me to recognize that the value from engineering wasn't just in the work that I did or the company that I worked for, it was the skills that I had. And so for me, recognizing that, you know, my analytical thinking, my ability to take big problems and break them down into, into smaller pieces to be able to look at a project schedule and schedule it so that it sort of has a flow to it. That's all helping me succeed and differentiate myself as a business consultant. You know, in fact, here I am, what is it, 2016, six years, seven years now from my last engineering job. And one of the things in my business consulting that I'm looking to do now is reconnect to engineering companies. Mm -hmm. Engineering companies, oil and gas companies, let's say in the nuclear industry that are a little bit more I don't want to say outdated, but a little bit more outdated in terms of their thinking of how their industry is serving humanity. So here I am six, seven years later, I'm looking to reconnect with some of those engineering companies and help them discover what is the humanity in their business. So it's quite amazing how the two worlds are coming together in this moment. Mm, yeah, that's and the mindset thing. That's that's a 
a, a big aspect there with engineering. You're right. It is a mindset and it's how we, how we think about things and just being able to shift that and bring what you learn. Nothing is really wasted as long yeah. as you're able to reflect and bring that. Okay. I'll pass this on to you, Erica. How did you see past experiences helping down the line and how were you able to even articulate them? Yeah. And thank you, VJ, for that mindset, not like versus career thing. Um, even though not an engineer. Um, that really, really resonates for me as well. And I do a lot of hiring now in this position. Um, and so, you know, I really like to emphasize when I'm looking for people who, when I'm looking at people who are looking for employment, or certainly when I judge and analyze my own skills, you know, things like the executive functioning side, the soft skills. Um, I'm not an HR, so if I'm using some of these terms a little incorrectly, you can correct me afterwards. But like, you know, th this uh, team playing and how you work well with others and how you are in a you know stressful situation and how you show up when you're having a bad day and you know how you are in terms of accountability and responsibility I mean those for me in the nature of the work that we do um you know it's very very different of course in like something very technical like engineering but in in not-for-profit where we're you know our organization provides opportunities grants and you know um programs for indigenous youth um you know we're meeting all sorts of people every day at all points of you know places in their lives and so much of this is just relational and how to engage with people and how to understand what they need and then to create a plan moving forward and we, we're not a frontline services we don't do social work um, but it's still being really responsive to community and absolutely the development of narr narratives in, in theater making is the exact same thing, you know, what is, what is a goal and how are you going to get there and what are the supports you need to get there and I think that's, you know, true for so much of what we do all the time. Um, it's true for my role in managing communications team, it's true in my role of like now doing a lot of operations as an executive for a large national not for profit. So, um, you know, I think I think that the the soft skills or those sort of mindsets um, exist wherever we're at. And you know, one of the biggest things and determinators for me right now is just like, where am I putting my energy and my time? And so, at the end of the day, the purpose and vision of the organization I'm working for, I'm like, that feels really even when we have crappy days, which you know, obviously, it still feels good that that's ultimately what we're working for. Ultimately, what our vision is, that's what feels good coming home at the end of the day. Um, and I think that that's something that that people, again, I think, you know, sometimes these are privileged conversations because also sometimes we just need to work. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, if that's the thing, the closer you can get, and I'll leave it to Anna, who I'm sure is going to have lots of wisdom on this, but like the closer you can get to combining those two things, I think is where people find the most satisfaction and where they want to be. Mm. Nice. Thank you. And Anna, I'll pass it on to you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I uh, actually was going to talk about something slightly different, but as you guys were, were chatting uh, and sharing your experiences, there were three points that um, kind of came up that I wanted to bring up. Um, number one being it, the fact that we tend to um, discount what we bring to the table and how valuable that actually is. because it's typically things that, um, especially kind of thinking of um, our our strengths, we those are things that come easy to us, and we think, well, well, everyone knows how to do that. Everyone knows speaking of soft skills. Everyone knows like this is this is easy. Mm -hmm. So we tend to not to focus on that. We tend not to sell that because we think that that's just a natural thing that everyone knows how to do. And my personal example with that is my, my bachelor's degree is in communications. And for years, I used to say, well, whatever that means. Mm -hmm. uh, that was something that I would always add because it wasn't engineering, right? Because it wasn't cool and hard and prestigious. Because that's, again, what we've been told for years is that that sort of degree is meaningless that you didn't learn anything and it wasn't until I was um working in consumer goods and I was managing my accounts and I remember I uh, was on vacation and one of my coworkers took kind of over my accounts and then I came back and I was reading emails I'm like who talks to clients like that my mind was just absolutely blown and that's when it hit me oh my gosh I spent five years in my undergrad writing, reading, uh, 
for, for hours and mm-hmm. hours and hours and hours. I'm like, oh, I actually learned something. I learned how to communicate and how to do it well and how to do it effectively. And it's not something that comes easy and natural. So that's kind of thinking of when you are transitioning and you look at this different career and you feel like, well, I don't really have anything to bring. And you do. In fact, something that I want you to think about is the fact that what makes you different and this other experience that you bring that someone else doesn't have is your selling point. Because you learn something that all of those other candidates that have maybe the the right experience, quote air quotes here, that they don't have. So what did you learn from that other experience that someone else doesn't have? So that's what you need to be selling. Hmm. And another point I wanted to make was um, uh, soft skills. So Erica talked about soft skills and um, this is just Oh my gosh, so true. So I have hired in my recruitment experience for hundreds of roles, different industries, different experience level from like fresh out of school or some of the roles were like without a degree even to like multiple six figure type of roles. So really all across the board, the number one skill that the hiring managers are asking for is guess what? Communication skills. No matter, and again, I've hired for very technical roles. I've hired for like developers, um, I don't know, very technical like finance roles. If, like you name it, I've hired for it. The number one skill, and that's what I would used to do. I used to uh, brief my recruitment team on, okay, these are the top three skills we're looking for from someone for this role. The number one was always communication skills. Mm-hmm. Always, that's just... And again, that is absolutely uh, applicable to every single next job that that you will have. Mm -hmm. So those are some of my points here. Yeah, really good points. I think one of the things you talked about was selling the thing that, um, because you have a story when you're transitioning from one career to another to another, it does make you unique. So using that as part of your storytelling is very important. I guess my follow-up, and I'll start with Anne and I'll pass it off to anybody else who wants to answer as follow-up to your point is, what would you say to someone who is either struggling to, because some, some, transitions need relevant experience mm-hmm. um, and some need those measurable experience. What, what would you say to someone who's either struggling to gain the experience or the career path that they want? Um, how would you suggest they go about it? What, what steps do you think they should take? Well, there, there are two things here. So um, yes. So what, when you are transitioning, um, sometimes they do say that they want experience, but it's not necessarily true so you can still push and you can still make it happen without that specific experience in the industry even though right now you might be listening you're like uh, I don't know this doesn't seem right uh, but hey I'm an example I went from accounting to consumer goods to recruitment right um but for me that wasn't through applying online mm-hmm. and we we can talk about this more but um what I want you to think about is what the employer is always looking for. They're looking for I, the safest, easiest hire. The safest and easiest hire is someone who's done the exact same job they're hiring for right now with a competitor. Like that's their default because that's the safest and easiest hire, right? Like that makes a lot of sense. So if you're coming from a different function, a different industry, a different city, you're not the safest hire because their default is this, this first person. Right. So if you're changing anything, just applying online will be really hard because their default is this first person. So that's when your uh, your proactive networking becomes a lot more important. And that's when you can actually start landing interviews without having that industry experience. So that's kind of first part of it. So you don't always have to have industry experience, even though it feels like you do. And then if for some industries or some often even seniority level, they would ask for you to have some exposure. Um, there are a few things that you can consider. Volunteering obviously is, is one of them. Um, but a big one is to um, 
and, and I feel like VJ maybe can talk about this, is uh, taking on consulting projects, looking for those opportunities, and they can be pro bono projects. They can be, uh, let's say you're trying to get into digital marketing, right? There are resources like, like Upwork, for example, is a good one, uh, where you can find freelance work. You can work on a small project for very, very potentially little money, but just to get some experience and just to get enough for you to be able to have a conversation about it. Mm -hmm. For you to be able to add that on your resume that I worked as a freelancer or as a pro bono consultant on the specific type of project. Um, But again, I would, again, depending on the industry and the type of role you're going for, but I would put the emphasis on this first step, which is building your network in the industry that you're, or specific company that you're trying to get into. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good point. And I think even just the idea of um, starting to work on projects and things like that to build up those skills that you can talk about is good. And and I'm actually going to pass it to Vijay to answer the same question about how do you gain relevant experience, um, but also, you know, sometimes having the time to gain relevant experience might be a privilege when you've been laid off. (laughs) You might not have like, this is, I need to immediately get this. So, so how, how, what would you say to people who need to gain relevant experience, maybe in a shorter period of time? Oh, just for me, shorter period of time. Anyone can answer, but I'm just passing it on. I'll defer (laughs) that one because uh, my, my thought process was going to be sort of acceptance and giving yourself patience. Mm -hmm. And I think career transitions, at least for me, it's, it takes time. You know, like I, I think when I transitioned to a career, like, oh, I wanted to be the perfect business consultant yesterday. And that mm-hmm. pressure for me, it, it's at times overwhelming. So um, I think I'm still trying to navigate exactly how that like seamless that transition looks like. I think there was a question in the chat. I won't get to it, but it talked about sort of like if you take a bit of a financial hit and what does that look like? And certainly that has been the case for me initially. So I think Yo-Yo, I'll defer to Eric or Anna if they want to add in terms of that quicker transition for me it has been a, a process of patience and, and, and self-care. Mm-hmm. And I don't want to discount the importance of patience, actually, because like you're saying, um, you you want to be the best consultant yesterday, but yeah. there are things that you're bringing in that have, have probably been helpful and you just kind of just started, you've just done it. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, Erica, you unmuted. I'm going to let you go. Um, I mean, I'll be the happy middle here. Um, <laughs> just, I, I think it, it is about being just, again, responsive. Like, I don't know that you can dictate the pace. Like, I think, you know, real life situations and there's all the variables, you know, like, again, you know, Anna was talking about before, certainly it's different when you don't have like community or familial supports. If you don't, I don't know, to have a partner or bestie who can, you know, like cover your rent for a month, you're in a very different situation than, you know, than if you don't have those things. So I, I do think that like, we have to be responsive to our environments, to our personal needs, to what's going out there and to who we are and the way we work. I know patience is something that I practice every day and I'm not very good at. Um, again, you could reference my children later for that one. Um, but, you know, so feeling very active in, in a search was something that was like really important to me, like just feeling like I was doing something, like I was moving something forward. And that meant like a lot of garbage activity is what I would call it. Um, but ultimately, I think it was networking. And maybe that's where the segue for this conversation will ultimately go. Mm. But it was just like asking for coffees or doing the research or trying to figure it out or trying to get involved or trying to, you know, w- whatever it was was um just putting a little bit of energy focus and intentionality towards it um that helped build a little bit of space as well and obviously like when you're talking about skills it's really different if you're like a surgeon than if you're like you know going to work at a not-for-profit and like various whatever and I'm not a I'm not a session expert right I'm not a policy expert I'm again like I really focus on my soft skills um project management you know things like that so so whether it's, you know, an academic route um, and it could be something as big as, as a, you know, graduate school degree as, as, as Vijay had shared that, that he did, or if it's, you know, an online learning rubric, like I, I think that there are, are different steps forward to get yourself there. And whether it's like formally asking someone for a coffee who's never met you before in a million years and sending an email to the info account, or whether it's, you know, 
attending an event, knowing that someone's going to be there and like, you know, just going up to them, you know, there's, there's a million different um, methodologies. And, and I think you just have to be responsive and engaged in like what is specific to your work community, what is specific to you as an individual and what your biggest needs and goals are. Nice. Thank you. Um, and, and you kind of were leading into my next question. So I'll keep with you, Erica, and then let I'll throw it out to anyone else. But you talked about networking. And, and as we know, networking, people talk about it being the most fundamental aspect of career development and transitioning and things like that. Um, what roles did your network play for you? And how did you engage in authentic networking? I can't emphasize this enough. Um, I've never gotten a job from putting in an application cold and applying for it. Mm. Just never have. Um, and in fact, like, sadly, like I applied for a job once and I was like, I am literally perfect for this. And you know what, 20 years later, I was, and I am still like, and, and I didn't even get an interview. And I was just so shocked and appalled. And now that I do a lot of hiring, you know, you know, we have to talk about honest things here and um, whether it's like nepotism on one edge of things or whether it's, you know, like who, you know, um, I think for me as somebody on the hiring end of things, it's more just about like really having a face, a name and an actual human being attached to something. Um, and so th those have come to me very cold before. I am the type of person who takes a lot of coffees with people I've never met before. I like to say yes, because that's ultimately how I got engaged and established in my job. It was really through people I knew. Um, I do want to recognize the layers of privilege that come from that. I was born in Toronto. I grew up in Toronto. So I know a lot of people who live in Toronto, which is still where I live and work. Um, so that, those are those are true privileges that were afforded to me. Um, but making yourself, and I, you know, I think people can speak differently in, in the corporate world, but in my sort of creative artsy or social justice, not-for-profit industries, like making yourself engaged and known is absolutely everything. And so maybe it's worthwhile paying the money for that conference attendance, or maybe it's worthwhile um, showing up to a seminar like this, where you can ask a question at the end, and then you can follow up with the person saying, I'm the one who asked that question at the end. Make sure it's a good question, yeah. but just being bold. And again, the song soft skill that I would say in that is like, if you are a shy person, if you are the person who just crumbles at shaking hands, if you're the person who's like me, not great with names all the time, those are the skills you work on. And, and there's a real big fake it till you make it with that one. Like, you know, as, as Anna said, communication is a really, really important skill for virtually anything you have to do. And certainly in this new world of work where many people are virtual, at least some of the time, um, how you can engage with somebody in an authentic, real human way um, is not only like a good comfortable thing to have as a human being who has to navigate the public sphere, but certainly if you're ever doing anything that's client or patient or human interfacing is something that you're going to have to do anyway. Yeah. Yeah. So what I'm hearing, Erica, is everyone add her on LinkedIn afterwards. Um, and it seems like you're <laughs> open to the conversation. So you I will just not there. <laughs> I will just follow up. I am so I'm so not like official at, at these sorts of things. Like I don't often check my LinkedIn, but you can find me. My my email is public at work. And I, I absolutely would. I love that. If, if I get I find great value um in in helping people because I was so helped and I still need help. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm really big on community. Mm -hmm. Erica, who pays for the first coffee? How does that work? Is it I use a cup first coffee on you or hundred percent on me? A hundred percent on me because right, I, have I have a job. I'm flying. I have a job. And you can get a fancy latte. Nice. So VJ is now uh networking person number one, from what I hear him saying. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'll pass it on to you actually, VJ, to answer the question about networking too. How did you expand your network, especially in and and um, VJ and Anna, you'll probably be both able to answer this question just as being entrepreneurs. That's something that's an important skill. So I'll start with you, VJ. How did you expand your network? How do you suggest that as a consultant? And then and then over to Anna. Oh, sure. before you answer, I see a few questions coming in already. Um, this is my last question that I prepared. Um, I know this is not all about just me asking questions. So if anyone has any questions, feel th feel, feel free to put them in and I'll get th to them right after this one. All right, go ahead, VJ. Yeah, no, sounds good. I appreciate you mentioning that, Yo-Yo. I think, you know, funny, my experience of networking has changed uh, during the span of my career. Before I started my, my business school, I guess maybe they, they, they brainwashed me, but before I started my business school, I used to think networking was a dirty word. I even thought marketing was something that was dirty. And I think it was, I had perhaps 
a limited perception of what it was. I thought networking was where just people went to shake hands and be like, hey, can you get me a job? If not, I don't want to talk to you. And I thought it was just very much this transactional, transactional business uh, thing. And it, and it can be, right? I think some people can do that. And maybe for them, it's authentic. Maybe for them, it's fear. And they're really just trying to sort of like be as quick as they can and sort of bridging these connections. So that was my mentality, you know, before my, my, my MBA program. During the MBA program, I started to learn the complexities of what marketing is, of what networking it is. And so I learned that for me anyway, networking wasn't necessarily just about getting a business opportunity. I think Erica has mentioned it, Anna, you mentioned the importance of communication, the importance of relationship building. For me, networking was an opportunity to learn from people, to connect, to follow my curiosity. Oh, what brings you here? Why are you doing what you're doing? Right. So start asking some of those questions in those opportunities. So when I took that shift from sort of looking for work from networking to learning, it changed my outlook. Mm. Um, there's an expression uh, I've heard from um, in the uh, fundraising uh, industry. It goes, if you if you uh, ask somebody for money, they'll give you advice. If you ask somebody for advice, they'll give you money. So just sort of reframing it, that mind shift where you're now giving him a chance to express value. And like Erica said, I'm with you, Erica. I try not to, when I was looking for jobs online, I much rather do that in-person connection to build that relationship versus just becoming another resume that's competing with all the other resumes out there. And so I think that's for me, the, the biggest thing that I've learned with networking is that shift from looking for a job to following my curiosity and to building relationships. And it's amazing how it served me. It's the idea of curiosity and being mutually beneficial too. You talked about asking why people were there and being curious to understand why they were there. Maybe you can offer them. Yeah. Too. Yeah. Okay. All right. Last but not least, Anna, and then I'll, I'll look through these questions here. Ooh, well, networking is probably my favorite topic when it comes to careers. And, um, it is my favorite topic for, for, for two reasons. Um, similar to how VJ felt about it, I did not know how to do it when I started. It was scary, um, especially for someone who doesn't speak English as their native language. And when I started, I don't think my English was even that, that good. I remember being scared that I would like forget like the words, like I would not know what to say because I would just freak out and wouldn't know how to speak English. Um, in addition, I'm an introvert. I didn't know anyone. So all the kind of fears that are usually coming up for people, I've been there. <laughs> and um, I went from there to really making networking my career because in my last corporate job in recruitment, that's what I was doing for a living. I was reaching out and meeting with hiring managers looking for opportunities. Like that was my job. I was paid to network. So it is 100% possible to learn how to do it, even if you've never tried it before, even if you're an introvert, even if English is not your first language. Um, but the biggest thing here with networking is really what VJ was talking about is that mindset shift from I'm here to get something and I'm doing this, this to, to lend a job to I'm just here. And that really is what networking is. Networking is meeting with people you want to talk to, you genuinely want to talk to and learn from no strings attached. That's it. You're not there to get anything. You're just there to learn. Mm. And if you're thinking, well, if I'm there to learn, how am I going to get a job? Mm. Right. <laughs> but think about it this way. There is this concept of it's the law of reciprocity. When you give people the time and space to share and you ask them questions, people want to reciprocate. People want to do something for you because you just gave them 30 minutes to talk about themselves. So people want to do something for you, right? So that's why one of the reasons why people would help you, right? And there are a ton of other reasons, like, um, you know, someone has done this for them, just like what Erica was talking about. So they know what it feels like 
they also can potentially get compensated if they refer you and you get hired, right? So there, there are a ton of things that are going on in the background, but um, a few things that I, and again, we can, I can talk about networking for the next like two hours, <laughs> but something that I also want. So the biggest thing is this mindset shift from I'm here to get something to I'm here. This is the most interesting person that I've ever met. So that's, that's what you want to feel talking to someone. I want to learn as much as possible about them. Now, in terms of meeting people is where a lot of people get stuck mm. and reaching out to people. Um, so this is where I would really um, think about that mindset. I'm not reaching out to them because I just submitted my job, my application back to what networking is, right? I'm reaching out to them because I want to learn about them. Right. So this is like, whenever you're like, what, what, what do I ask? How do I reach out? Go back to the fundamentals of I'm there to learn about them. That's it. That's all I'm doing. Mm -hmm. That's my goal. Number one. And, um, I actually have, because there's just so much, um, like there's so many misconceptions and mistakes that come up with networking for a lot of people. And that idea that it's like a dirty word. I've even, one of my students once said, um, I feel like I'm bending backwards, like in my head, networking is bending backwards for strangers. Mm -hmm. Right. But we just learned that, no, no, I'm just meeting interesting people and learning from them. Right. Um, so I actually have, it's a, it's a free short training. You can watch on my website, like 20 minutes, really breaking down different networking mistakes and what to do instead. So I do encourage you to, uh, to have, have a watch, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, good question. And and I think one of the things you mentioned about um, if you frame the mindset around what do I want to learn from them, it's actually easier to come up with questions because you know what you want to learn. It's easier to ask the questions based on that versus what am I supposed to be asking? Um, so I will go to the questions. I see questions have come in. Um, if there is a question that... Um, comes up. Okay. So some of them are coming in the chat. Some of them are coming in Q and A. So I'm going to try to navigate both of them. But if there's a question that comes up that you want to answer, you're welcome to, you don't have to answer every question. Um, I will start with the first one that I see when you make career changes to find more fulfilling work, did those choices ever even initially have a negative impact on your finances? And if they did, how did you deal with that? So negative impacts on your finances at all. I can take this one. Um, so for me personally, it did not. Um, however, here's what I would invite you to think about when it comes to finances and career change. Um, your basic needs for, for safety for, uh, and safety comes with, you know, paying for your everyday expenses, right? Those needs need to be met first. Right. So saying that, you know what, I'm just going to quit my job and whatever happens, happens. This is not realistic because when your basic needs are not met and you're freaking out about paying your bills, this, this job that you think is your dream job is not going to make you feel like this is a dream job because your basic needs that come before fulfillment, right? The, the, the hierarchy of needs, right? They need to be met first. So I would always start there. Okay, what do I need to make sure that those basic needs for me just really covering my, my expenses, my basic expenses, that those needs are met, whether it's savings, whether it's um, getting help, if you can get help. Uh, for me personally, it was really just living off of savings when I you know, moved from Vancouver to Toronto, I quit my job to figure out what's next, that was living off of savings, but I really planned for that, right? Um, and again, for some people, that's not really an option, right? To quit their job and live off of the savings, right? But I would really start with, okay, well, what, what is that going, going to look like for me if I am taking a pay cut, even though I sincerely believe that you don't have to, but if it is the case, what is that covering the basics, what is that going to look like so that I'm not freaking out about that? And I can actually focus on kind of the needs that come after that. 
I think um, I can just add to that one, Yo-Yo, because I, I, Anna, did you want to add more to that or that was? No, go ahead. I just, I, I'm, I, I, in a way, I'm drawn to this question because one of the challenges I, I had when I was leaving, uh, you know, oil and gas, I was a project manager. I was making good, good money. I, in fact, financially, I'm not, I'm not where I was when I was in the engineering world. And I'm okay with that. I think like, like Anna said, the important thing is the, the basic life needs are being met and I'm grateful for that. That's, that's the case. Uh, but it's been funny, again, coming back to the mind shift, when I switched from just targeting a financial target, it's amazing how many other different things open up my life. Not only are we, we're not just defined by how much we make, right? There's, there's financial capital. There's also other elements of capital, social capital. So what I've discovered is that although right now I am making less than I was an engineer, I'm finding value in many other things. It's amazing how exploring that in our careers also leans into or sort of lends itself into our personal lives. I'm finding I'm more connected with my family. I'm finding I'm more connected with my, in my relationships, with my friends. So it's funny that this exploration of money just not being the only target is allowing me to find value in other things. So my invitation for those folks that are considering about that, like Anna said, yes, make sure that the basic financial needs are being met but also ask yourself, what else is valuable to me and how am I fulfilling that? I'll, I'll just add one sentence here. Um, there are at different points of your life, um, you will value potentially different, and this is a perfect example, different, uh, different aspects of what a career brings for you. Right. And I would just think of it, you know, how on a, um, like a DJ set, there are like those dials, like up and down. Right. So think about it. That's how I would think about it. Right. So compensation is one of them. Feeling good about what you do is another one. Right. And um, I would also add like, uh, like kind of creative kind of expression. And you just dial up and down. So it doesn't mean that they will all will be at a hundred all the time, because we know that in that DJ set, it's never all the way up, right? For it to be a perfect balance, you kind of move it up and down, right? So in different um, kind of stages of your career, and it sounds like VJ right now, you move down like the compensation a little bit, but the other aspect of you actually feeling good about what you do is up. Right. So that's kind of how I would also think about it. Yeah, that's a good analogy. Can I do a bit of a rapid tease on that too? Um, just because that really um, reminds me that I really want to share that for me, like one of the most important things about a job that I have is autonomy and fluidity. So I actually am one of those people who like doesn't mind taking it into my evenings, doesn't mind taking it into my weekends, sometimes feel like things I'm doing not for work sort of play into work. Um, but the thing about autonomy too, even when I was in my role in as a literary manager in theater, there's just the culture of creative arts that way where people take and are allowed to, and it's encouraged and expected that you'll be taking work outside of the work that you're actually, you know, engaged professionally for. So that even though autonomy was my goal there and this idea of fluidity was my goal there, that was my dial turned up. I love that analogy. Um, thanks for sharing that. It actually translated into um, better compensation because I would do side gigs and I would do side hustles. And that was, you know, a, a, again, a different period in my life where I was happy to sort of work a lot and, and, you know, like many, many, many extra hours a week and, and, and something that I really loved because I liked what I was doing. Right. And because I felt very invested in it, it didn't ever feel like a sacrifice. It felt really good. I felt very engaged. I felt very passionate about putting in those extra hours and stuff. So I think also, you know, when one dial goes up, it allows room. And I think both of you kind of alluded and said this, but it allows room for other things too. Um, so that's all I wanted to share with that one. Yeah, really good, really good point. Thank you. I see more questions coming in. So I want to try to make sure I get through all of them. There's one, there are two questions that are kind of similar and I'm going to merge them in a way. Um, so someone mentioned, can you talk about career change after a career break? And so they mentioned they worked for 13 years in law, but have been home with kids for almost four years um, and returning to work 
to change industries is daunting. So they're not sure where to start. I'm going to combine it and it might not exactly be um, the same kind of question, but someone was talking about how do I explain changing careers in a resume? Um, and so how do you tell that story? I'm gonna, I'm gonna combine those questions if that's okay. And anyone can go first. I'll, 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 I'll start. Um, a couple of things that come up right away for me here. Um, number one is a career break. And that's kind of something that I want to have like on a poster somewhere. A career break is not a bad thing. <laughs> you don't need to explain it. You don't need to worry about it. I know we hear that. Oh, it's like a red flag for employers. It's not. Honestly, yes. If you do a year somewhere and then you have a break for two years, then you do another six months, you take another break. And that's all kind of your resume is really broken down. Yeah, that's kind of a red flag. But in general, a uh, break is not a red flag. What I would think about for yourself, for your own mindset is, okay, well, what did I learn in those four years, right? Staying home with kids, I'm sure you learned a lot. Maybe it's patience, maybe it's time management, right? So going back, that's what I would start thinking about. Okay, well... I did take a break from my career, but I learned these other skills that I now, it makes me a better candidate because I am now, let's say a mom or a dad, right? So that's, that's the first uh, piece. Now with a career change, again, you don't need to explain it. And I put it in, in air quotes on your resume. Instead, whether it's your resume or your LinkedIn profile, you craft it in a way that now someone in that new career that you're looking into, when they look at your resume or your LinkedIn profile, like, yep, yeah, it makes sense why this person is now going for this new career. So the way I would think about it is look at your past experiences and think, okay, well, what is important to showcase? It might mean that some of the experiences that you have, you even totally scratch or just leave like one bullet point but some will be more detailed. And again, it doesn't mean that everything that's on there right now is relevant. You are just highlighting whether it's a specific experience, specific skill in that role that you had that is relevant for what you're doing next. So you first, before you touch your resume, need to figure out, okay, well, this is what I'm doing. Okay, what skills and experiences are necessary for this new career? Okay, what did I do in the past that is relevant? So now let's make sure that when someone looks through my resume, that or my LinkedIn profile, that's what they see. Now they must, might ask you in an interview why you're switching to this industry, to this industry, and you need to have a really good answer here. And I would kind of go back to the networking piece. So if here you have an answer, hey, you know what, Mr. and Mrs. Interviewer, I've met with 20 people in this industry and I now know 100% that this is it for me for these three reasons, right? It's going to sound a lot more convincing than, well, I heard that tech is cool now and sexy. So that's what I want to do. I don't know if I was allowed to say that. <laughs> uh, but um, that's what I would think about when it comes to changing careers. Thanks, Anna. VJ Erica, good? Okay. I just quickly add, I think just recognizing, like Anna said, a career break doesn't have to be a bad thing. And I think just recognizing we talked about the importance of looking within and, and really exploring what we want to do and diving into that sphere. Maybe it's a, it's a, it's a good, good thing in terms of during that break, if you've had family, your values, like Anna said, right, that sort of that dial have now reshifted. And now like you can craft that message, why you're more aligned from a values perspective with this new career goal and like who doesn't want to hire based on that I, I know that when I'm passionate about work I'll work that that much better I'll work that much harder and so who doesn't want to see there's a been a bit of a shift of values alignment so I like basically just looking at the opportunity for personal development and how you can bring that to the job market in the growth I'm not saying it's not it's not it's still hard and obviously has its challenges but uh, applauding that growth we've done Erica, you wanted to add to that? I saw you come off mute. <laughs> I did. I did come off mute. I, I didn't think I had much to add after Anna, but I, I yeah, I want to like, you know, if you have 
the opportunity to help normalize this. Like I know, again, you know, I work for a young not-for-profit and like those sorts of breaks and like staying home with family, those things are encouraged. They're celebrated. Um, you know, I, I, let's hope that we're not in the same 1950s workplace where it's one factory job for the rest of your life and you're never allowed to like, you know, and all the feminist, you know, wins that we've had, glass ceilings and like, you know, long way to go. But like, let's celebrate that also in our job search. I mean, if you've taken, you know, time off to be with your family, come in as you've just been said, as you've just been told, like come in confident and acknowledging that that was like a good beneficial thing to who you are as a human and, and, and what you can offer because of that. Um, you know, like, don't even don't, I, I love what you said, Anna, like never apologize for that. And if you're at an, if you're vying for a job where like, that is not something that, you know, they can see or they can listen to, or they're not even inspired by you when you're saying that, then like, you know, maybe it's not the right place for you yeah. to be anyway. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. we don't believe in personal growth at this organization. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's where I want to go. It's actually interesting. And, and I'm, I'm not supposed to, I know that the questions are for you, but I, I'm going to share a, a, someone's resume I had seen um, and people list off their job experiences and, and that person's resume. Um, this is just to answer the person who said they had been out of work for four years as a parent um, said, stay at home parent. And then they listed bullet points of their achievements and things that they had done in those four years. Wow. They got Beautiful. an interview immediately. So um, <laughs> yeah, just being able to, to see every opportunity is something that's transferable. I love that. And if that resume came across one of our, like, and again, we hire a lot. Um, and if that, if I saw that on a resume, I would think already, wow, that's an innovative person. That's mm -hmm. somebody who's going to advocate internally. What about all the parents who work here are going to feel supported by this person? They're creative. They're like, think about all the amazing things that just putting that on a resume shows. Mm -hmm. So I would say, I encourage that to people on this call right now. If you were yes. to stay at home for a while, put that in your resume. I think it's yeah. awesome. I saw that. That was cool. Okay. Um, I will ask the next question that I see here. So I'm interested in, and you can all speak about this. I'll maybe, because we have 15 minutes left, so I'll, I'll say if you're itching to answer this one, definitely go. I'm interested in hearing everyone's experience. Okay. Everyone's experience on mentors. How does someone go about finding mentorship for someone who has no experience in that industry? I mean, I'll jump, I'll go first. Um, so I don't think, I think it goes back to your networking skills. I think like mentorship, and again, it might be really different in business or whatever, but like in my world, it's not formalized. And I have lots of people who I have called mentors and who have provided mentorship to me. Um, you know, I think that it's really, again, about, about re relationships and communication. So if you work on those skills, then you will find somebody in your, and again, I know that there are more like concretized, formalized ways to do this. Well, so I'll, I'll let BJ and Anna speak to that um, if they have anything to offer there. But I would just say it's really about engaging with people, creating relationships with people, and then, um, you know, being able to maintain that relationship. Eventually, I, I found that there's organic growth into it. So I actually, the manager who is one of my direct reports right now, um, you know, it, I've I've known them for eight years and they refer to me as their mentor. And I of course get shy and like, you know, aw shucks about it. Um, but it's true. They were a student when I first met them and they came to me in some of those ways that we were talking about before, one-off gigs, part-time this, you wanted to engage in this conference that we were producing. And so they volunteered. Um, we pay volunteers, but it was still a volunteer, you know, we underpay <laughs> volunteers, I think is what I would say. <laughs> I got a little something. Um, and now they're a manager and they're 26 and I, I'm thrilled and they're amazing. So I think it just happens sometimes. And not that it just happens, but I think that the growth from meeting someone to mentor can be organic sometimes. Mm -hmm. I'd quickly just say that I think something that's really topical for me right now is I'm, as I'm, I'm, I'm doing this business currently just by myself. Um, it's lonely, uh, you know, doing an entrepreneurial journey, it's lonely, mm -hmm. it's hard. And I, and I want to, and I want to do good at it. And so I think recognizing that um, I can't do everything myself as much as I sometimes want to. Uh, and so external supports, and I think in, in form of mentorship, whatever that may look like to you, 
is is huge. And so currently, I have a few informal mentors that I've that I've sort of structured. I meet on a regular basis. I'm still looking to formalize and build that. But having somebody that's in your corner during some of these difficult career uh, points is is huge. And so uh, I think advice that I would give even to myself, but to you, is this like set your intentions. What are you looking for? Uh, what kind of support and what kind of uh, mentor do you want to have? Is there someone that you see yourself maybe in 10 years time, in 20 years time? Uh, and then like, uh, like Erica said, it goes back to that, net, that networking and that relationship building. And so LinkedIn, I found is a good, good, um, good way, but also asking people. One of my favorite questions I ask when I'm trying to expand my network is like, hey, I'm looking for this. Do you know anyone you think I should talk to? Mm. It's amazing when you invite people to open up their Rolodex of contacts to, to outdate myself a little bit, they'll, they will do that, right? They will put you in touch uh, with the right person. Thanks, BJ. All right. And anything to add? Should I move on? I mean, we, we can chat about this further, but I think let's, <laughs> let's keep going. Okay. Mentoring let's... is Anna's second favorite topic after, <laughs> after networking. She has a, a there's, a, I don't know if that's true. <laughs> Um, thanks, BJ and Anna. Um, so I'm just gonna make sure. Okay, I got a message. I'm gonna try to see if I can narrow it down. So, um, Erica mentioned that in applying for jobs, so like like Erica mentioned, they've applied for jobs, and um, even when they're qualified, they're not getting any callbacks. Um, it's also hard. So I'm trying to take a shift in my career, but I'm applying to more entry level roles. But from their CV and from their resume, they're actually not an entry level employee. So there's a little bit of a mismatch there um, and, and, and maybe a, a roadblock in trying to steer. Uh, do you have any suggestions on how they can navigate that? And I can guess what your answers are going to be, but I think I want to just address this. They try to find someone who works within the company. That's not always possible. Depending on the nature of the organization or company, I would say that like how much room is there for growth and how much like how rapidly can that correspond? Because sometimes taking that entry level position and then if you're qualified and you're great and you like are working with great people who can see that and there's room for elevation and like that happens very much in my world. Like, you know, somebody comes in and we're like, oh my gosh, I, we had someone go from like literal entry level to um, manager within a year because it was like, oh, like this person's incredible. Um, and it was, they were very emerging with their maybe second job that they'd ever had. Um, that's obviously not true for lots of places. Um, so I think it's also just understanding, like I, I, I would feel um, really hesitant about taking a job somewhere that you have no growth for a job that you don't like with some like idea that it might lead to something else. But I think that there are real opportunities for that in some of the places. So maybe it's just about doing enough research at that organization. Or um, I, I also find that at larger organizations and companies, um, sometimes HR will take a question externally, like no problems at all. Like, hi, I don't work there. I'm thinking of applying for this. Is this the culture at your place? You know, is there room for growth? Thanks, Erica. Um, I want to offer a bit of a different, actually, perspective here. Um, so so there, there are two components here that we're talking about. One is, uh, you know, when you're changing careers and you're applying and you're not really moving forward. And then another part was, well, why is it that I do meet the requirements, but I'm still not moving forward? So those are two different scenarios. And something that um, always shocks people when I talk about it. Statistically speaking, um, and again, this is just open, like you can Google it, the stats are out there. Only 15% of applicants get hired through submitting an online application. 85, so the rest, get hired through either being proactively headhunted. So that goes back to crafting your LinkedIn profile in a way that it does show up in their search when they're looking for someone. So through being proactively headhunted and through being referred, so through networking, right? So think about it this way, right? Only 15% of people get hired through applying online. But most applicants spend, you know, 99% of their time on their resume and applying online, right? So 
because of this, this, this setup, even if you are perfectly qualified, sometimes they already pre-recruited someone. That's why they already have a couple of people that they want to interview and someone has recommended them. So like, okay, well, it's a safer choice. So I'm just going to start there. Oh, one of them is great. Done. Hired. So that's why sometimes even when you're perfectly qualified, you don't get an interview. Now, if in addition to that, you're not perfectly qualified and you're changing perfectly qualified and you're changing careers. And in addition to that, there are people who have been pre-recruited and headhunted. That's why when you're applying, you're not getting interviews. So that goes back to what we were talking about earlier, which is getting proactive and getting out there and actually meeting people in the industry that you're trying to get into is what's going to lead to interviews a lot faster <laughs> than, um, than applying online. And I'll also share, like, this is the stats that are online, but in my personal experience, recruiting for, again, hundreds of jobs for the top employers in Canada, 99% of candidates that I hired came e either as a recommendation from someone. I would sometimes even call my past candidates and ask them, do you know anyone? because you're in the same industry, like you for sure know someone, because that's a lot faster for me to make a couple of calls and get four names than for me to post a job and hope and pray that someone perfect will apply, right? So in my experience, 99% of Canada came either from us proactively looking for them or through referrals. Most of the time, we wouldn't even post those jobs because we didn't have the time. We needed candidates oftentimes like 48 hours later. Mm. So most of them came through either referrals or being proactively headhunted. So that's where I would, as a candidate, focus your efforts. Thanks, Anna. Okay. So there are two questions here again that I want to try to combine. Um, so one of them said, um, how do you even determine who to reach out to? And again, some of this I've heard, how do you determine who to even reach out to? There are fewer conferences that you can approach people at. So LinkedIn is an option. Do you cold call? Is that is that an approach if you do struggle with that? And then just to combine a question that came before, and this is more specific, so I'm going to broaden it a little bit, but this person's talking about they want to write stories. That's something they're interested in. How do they start networking in this route? How do they um, start building a network if they're blogging already? You know, how do they how do they build that out? Um, so I'm going to combine those a little bit. I can yeah, always you're... take a question about networking, but I'll let someone someone else go. I, I was going to say, Yoya, you're so good at combining those questions. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I'm not sure how I'll answer the second one, but I think I just offer my thoughts in the first one in terms of like um, uh, how to approach people from networking. I, I think for, for myself, I love meeting with people. I love meeting with people. I'm a people pleaser in some ways. So I don't know if there's anyone resonating with that, but I would, someone would ask me to meet, I would, I would say yes. And I got to a point where I got exhausted and I forgot why I was meeting with these people. So one thing I would say when it comes to networking is sometimes fewer is more less is more. So I would just inv invite you to consider who is it that you really want to talk to? Think about, make a list. Who are the companies that you really want to talk to? Like Anna said, what are those cool companies that you find that you're aligned to? So aligned with. So just coming up with a little bit more intentionality around the networking, I think A is going to put you in a better spot because you're really curious about this. You really have a good reason why you want to talk, talk to this individual. So hopefully with that, it's going to help overcome some of that shyness. We're all going to be shy. We're going to be intimidated by people. But if the reward is so much more than the risk, mm. I think it will take that step. And as we get better at that, we're going to continue to take those steps uh, and overcome some of that challenge. So that, that was one thing I would say with, with networking is that uh, sometimes fewer is, is, is more, less is more. Thanks, VJ. I'm, I'm going to be contrarian just because sometimes I like to do that. Sure. And I love the idea of quality. I think quality is always the best approach and that's really, really good. And also <laughs> quantity, yes, and. often a, a really good thing. I mean, you know, it, there are less conferences now. I know because a large part of my job is, is managing teams that, that organize large scale multi-day conferences. But part of that is the pandemic. And so I think you're going to see a lot more conferences in person this year. I do think conferences are an excellent 
excellent way to meet people. And um, even if you're shy, there's so many facilitated networking, intentional spaces for those sorts of things. Um, also volunteering at conferences is a mm -hmm. really great way to get in and not pay a thing and, and also be sort of working with some of the organizers as well. And so that might really, really be great networking opportunities just as a side, as a side note. Um, so yeah, I, I don't want to dismiss what you're saying. Quality is great. If you're that type of person and you know two or three people that are revealing themselves to you and you can have meaningful conversations with them, I think do that. But if you don't know who those people are and you are just really curious and it's like unclear to you where, where to even begin, throw 30 <laughs> into the realm if you have the time for it and just take coffees. And, and when you show up, do be prepared and do make those interactions quality, mm -hmm. right? You don't want to just show up and, and think that you're going to your next appointment, like speed dating or something. But, um, but you know, uh, putting a lot of, of feelers out there because it's it's great. It's like, you know, VJ will will take a coffee. I will take a coffee. Um, lots of people take coffees, but not everyone will. And not everybody can at all the times, mm -hmm. right? So um, I, I think you just pick your approach. I'll, I'll add just, is my mic on? Yes. Um, I'll add just, just a couple sentences here, actually combining what you guys just talked about, Ooh, nice. because I think the quantity is important, especially what in, in, in two scenarios, when you, A, don't really know what you want to do, because that's how you can explore and actually talk to real people in real companies, real jobs and learn, okay, this sounds great. This doesn't sound great. Very quickly, you learn. Oh, this is not the path for me. I thought this was a cool company. This is not for me. Mm. And that's where quantity does and being that curious and just exploring becomes important. Mm. Now, when you, that's scenario number one and scenario number two is when you don't know a lot of people, then you do need to kind of build that quantity. But once you have a clear idea of what is it that you want to do, clear three, four five companies that you would want to work for, that's when you do quantity, uh, sorry, quality and you really focus on, well, who is going to help me move forward here? Let me only focus those people, focus on those people. And speaking of where to meet people, I know we talked about LinkedIn. I know we talked about uh, conferences. I'll offer you the easiest one for you to start tomorrow is real life. <laughs> I'll give you just a few examples of where my students have met people. One of my students said she met just recently, two weeks ago, she met a friend of a friend at a New Year's Eve party mm. and she does exactly what she wants to do. And she got introduced her to the hiring manager or right already, like in the last, this last two weeks, boom, someone met like a cousin, a friend of a cousin, I don't know, a cousin's friend at a wedding. Um, someone met someone at the, at the, like sitting next to them on the plane, wow. um, I've just, and I've done that multiple times, even though I am an introvert, but sometimes I'm in the mood, um, just Starbucks downtown people are in line and I just start chatting with them and, Oh, what do you know? My neighbors, especially when I was back in corporate, we were chatting. Oh, you work at a bank in my head. I'm like, Oh my gosh, I recruit for banks. I, <sighs> I must know where, where you work, which bank you work. I'm like, Oh, what do you know? You work for a bank. Which bank do you work for? Right? So really it can be anyone around you, you just have no idea that your, your neighbor is working for a bank that you're trying to get into. Yeah. Right. So just really putting it out there in the world and asking people that you already know in your life, Hey, do you happen to know anyone who work in tech? Oh, you know what? My, um, the friend that I went to high school with actually works at Salesforce. Mm -hmm. What do you know? So that's where I would start. Yeah. Yeah. That's a very good point. And, um, one of the things that sometimes will come up is you already have a network. You just need to let them know where mm -hmm. it is that you want to go next and, and starting to build that. So um, I see that we are at time. I cannot believe it because I'm sure there are lots of other questions that people have. Um, so I had I had a, well, a final question, but I'm going to hold it <laughs> um, because we've just heard so much that's already been shared and I want to respect the time here. But um, as our panelists have shared, you can find them on LinkedIn or their email addresses and things like that. We are recording this session so we can also share that with those of you who attended. Thank you so much to our audience for some really, really good questions. Um, and for asking these questions and being really engaged and made the conversation really interesting for me. Thank you so much to our incredible panelists today. It was great hearing the really valuable insights from this conversation. 
I learned a lot. I was taking notes of my own. Um, and I, I just hope you are all leaving here with some lessons learned, some great things to think about as you grow and stretch in the different directions that your careers may take you. Um, for more events and workshops and things like these hosted by Blueprint Career Services, log on to the portal. We're often updating with the uh, with the um, calendar. As you'll see, there are more, more panel events that are coming up. We also have a survey that's usually sent out right after. If there are any other topics you're interested in hearing more about, any other kinds of panel sessions, Sessions, please do include that. Thank you all so much for attending this session. It's been fantastic. Thank you to our panelists again. Um, very much appreciate everything that's been shared. Thank you all and have a great rest of your day. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye.